Well, so this is what I always say. Like, there's some people who say that they're Spain-inspired restaurants or Spanish-inspired restaurants. I always say we are Spanish restaurants that are inspired by everything else. And I think that's a real difference. Like, I don't make excuses for our food not being Spanish enough. To me, our food is Spanish to the core. We take inspiration from lots of other cultures, but our food's Spanish. Hello, listeners and viewers. This is Warren Wade Anderson. Welcome to the 79th episode of Inside the Phoenix. This week's guest is the chef and restaurateur, Alex Reich. Ms. Reich is the co-owner and co-chef, along with her husband, Edder Montero, of the Spanish cuisine restaurants La Vara in Brooklyn, El Quinto Pino, and Taquito in Manhattan. I had a great time speaking to Alex about her discovery of gastronomy and the philosophy behind her dishes. For the podcast listeners, I would strongly suggest that you watch the video version of this episode on the Inside the Phoenix website or the Inside the Phoenix Vimeo channel. You'll get to see Alex and her unique cuisines. If you have any questions about this or any other episodes in the series, please email me, warren at insidethephoenix.com. Let's join my discussion with Alex, recorded on September 20th, 2014, at Tequito, amidst her husband and employees preparing for the restaurant's first customers of the day. You were saying now about your mother that she started going back to school when you were very young. Mm -hmm. And she got her, she be eventually became a dentist yeah. in the United States. That's a very curious thing because it takes a lot of work, obviously, to do that. In retrospect, when you look back at that, what did you gain from that? Do you gain a certain sort of tenacity from uh, that? It I don't know. I mean, everybody in my family, uh, the women in my family definitely work. Like, we were sort of raised to, to think that we should do everything. Mm -hmm. um, and uh, what I've noticed is a lot of people my age, from really my age, um, like never married and never had children. I think because they, we were sort of told that we would always have time. Yes. And I feel like that escaped a lot of people. And I think part of it comes from that that notion that you can, you know, have everything, and you know it'll come, and you can, you know, put off certain things. And um, but so my mom, in a lot of ways, had everything. I don't think she loved. She loved owning her business, and she loved having an office, and it gave her a lot of pleasure, especially when she moved that office to our neighborhood. Like mm -hmm. to like, I think that gave her a lot of pride. But um, but I don't think that what she did, you know, for a living, even though she was good at it, I don't think she loved it the way that I love. You what love I cooking, do. right? But I also don't think it had as many awful parts as as like what we do either. Like I think mm -hmm. I have a more extreme profession mm -hmm. I think her job was a pretty good mom job in a way like you know she worked like nine to five and or nine to five thirty and it was demanding she had to show up and she worked with her hands like mm -hmm. I do it's right. not really that different in the end it's like you get all your customers from word of mouth and you need to please people and you need to take care of them and uh, it's not really that different it's still service I know that yeah. that's not how people perceive it because she's a doctor but I mean, my mom well, wasn't a uh, well, doctor the way my dad was a doctor, where he had a community of people that they were always like intellectualizing or like, you know, doing science. My mom was like taking care of people, you yeah. know, appointment by appointment, meal by meal. And but, then she would come home and cook for us. Amazing. And I think that she really enjoyed the, the mothering and the, the cooking part of what was expected of her, which is crazy. Crazy in the sense that she comes home after a day of work then she has to prepare an elaborate meal for you guys or yeah and 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 it became less elaborate the older we got we started eating more simply but when i was younger she would like put some serious food on the table like what like she would make stews and stuff those are like time consuming amazing things but to grow up with that kind of stuff means that you grow up with a palate you know it wasn't like everything was like all what we call all minute cooking like every it wasn't like oh let's put you know a lamb chop or a pork chop on a griddle it cooks in five minutes and we'll serve right. up some boiled broccoli that's how my kids eat like <laughs> and it became that way at my house when I was more of a teen like it was you know but when I was younger my mom would like plant meals there were more stews like 
um, some of the stews we still make here in my restaurant, mm-hmm, like mm-hmm. because those are the foods that you become more, most connected, you know, to. My mom used to make soup in the winter time. You know, we called it weekly soup, and she'd make it once a week. And we had a porch, and she would keep it frozen on the back porch. You can do stuff like that in Minnesota, and <laughs> and so she it didn't matter that we didn't have like a chest freezer or a big yeah, yeah, thing. Yeah. She would just put like entire huge pots of soup on the porch they would freeze and we'd like chip away at them and like eat them all week and then she would do it again like on the weekend <laughs> so so you, you you got that kind of um tenacity from your mom as far as to start something and keep it going am i am i reading no, into it no you know it's funny i was just listening i think i get that tenacity from my husband because I think I'm like very a dreamer and and don't know. It's not that I won't see things through, but like that keeping going part is like more etter than me. Mm-hmm. I can be very easily distracted. I can't. Um, I was actually listening to this story on the moth the other day. Okay. There was this girl who described this love affair that she had with this guy, and I, I totally related to it because she said, I met this guy, and he was a real doer. He wasn't always just talking about doing. He was a real doer, and he did the things he said he was going to do. And um, So I thought I was going to do all these things, but it was Edder who really, like, I did them with. So you, you're living in the Midwest, and then... At, at a certain point, which which college did you did you go to college? Which college? Yeah, I went to Madison. Went and, to Madison. Um, it was great, but I didn't like. I just wasn't focused on. What was your major? I was major? working on um, Italian and international relations. Okay. Um, but uh, but really, I was just very focused on these like jobs that I had, like making food and and having fun. And so so even laughing. in college, even in college, you were thinking about going into. I always wanted to do this. I probably should have just gone to culinary school. I mean, I'm glad that I didn't because I had a richer life and I had fun. But, like, I always wanted to open restaurants. What prevented you from doing it? I didn't know how to do it. I didn't know that there was a conventional school for that. And I I wasn't, I don't want to say I was discouraged, but I, like, I didn't know. I I wasn't encouraged. Okay. And, um... And I didn't know, I just didn't even know. I still remember I was on the cross-country ski team in ninth grade, and we went to Wisconsin to go skiing. Uh, and uh, we met these guys in this little bar. Mm-hmm. And, um, and I, th- I think they said I, we go to the Culinary Institute of America. And, and I think I said, I asked a girl who was older than me, who was like in 12th grade and also mm-hmm. on the team, I said, what does culinary mean? Like, I had no idea. <laughs> And I think that's the time too. You know, like people weren't talking about like gas, like gastronomic issues or like. Right. This is like. Right. This is probably like. Pursuits. Late seventies, early eighties. Eighties that you were thinking about. We were just cooking. What eventually gave you the courage to jump from the major that you were in to get go straight into mm-hmm. cooking and so and into? I didn't. I just like I went to go live in Italy. I wanted to get on this like espresso thing that was happening, and I thought that if I could like get in the coffee business or do something, I wanted to go to Italy, and I went to live there and went to like fall in love and never come back. And I went there and I hated it. What and parts so of Italy did you go to? I was to? in Milan, which is probably why I hated it. Um, <laughs> but I had a job there and I didn't have a job anywhere else. And so I went to, I had a really, really good friend, my best friend from high school. Um, he was living in Seattle at the time and he would like writing me real letters because that's the way we did it. And he would say, you should come to Seattle. And it, Seattle really truly was like where all lost people went <laughs> at the time. And I went there, and I got an amazing group of friends, and I got a job working in this packaged food business. And um, I was when that business, they kind of were closing down um, the part, of the wholesale part of the company, or reducing it, mm-hmm. the part that I was involved in. And um, so they laid me off, and that's when I went back to restaurants and was like, I'm going to go back and get a culinary degree. And I was going to go to the community college in Seattle, and I told my parents, um, who I think were kind of okay with it because I think they thought I was wasting my time, like, the whole time I was in Seattle. I don't, I don't think I was, but because uh, I think everything is, like, a journey, you know, but, like, I certainly wasn't doing anything that was leading me to, you know to here so I um, they said they were the ones that were like you should go to the best culinary school you can go to because that, that sounds great I mean, because and then I yeah and so then I ended up here 
because it was actually cheaper also than going to San Francisco. Cause San Francisco cheaper living here in New York? or Cheaper because it was upstate. And, ah. um, and living in New York is really, it, living in New York is really expensive, but living in San Francisco at the time in, in the 90s was extremely expensive. There was like zero vacancy rate. And That's right. Okay. it was really tough. Okay. All right. So I came out here. Eventually, you you started working at different restaurants. What is it that in in you know, because you 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 went to Italy. I'm sure you said you didn't like it. <laughs> what eventually got you into sort of Spanish food, and then then specifically the the type of food that you're you're serving yeah. here? Yeah. Well, I think the type of food that we serve without the Spanish aspect of it, like mm-hmm. the personal parts of the cuisine, would be what I would cook anywhere, anytime. I feel like that's just, like, the, the soul that I bring. Like, that kind of freshness and that kind of, like, that point of view is, like, particular. I guess it is particular to my personal history. Mm-hmm. The fact that I'm making Spanish food would be incidental if it weren't for the fact that Spanish food really attracted me because it had all the same priorities that I had in cooking as before I met it, kind of, or before I got really involved in it. And also, I already spoke the Spanish language, so I understood it intuitively, immediately. And, uh, and my mom had always made a lot of these dishes, even though she made them in her own sort of mm-hmm. bastardized way. Right. Um, so certainly, like, all those things, and then made it easy. The reason that I even moved towards Spanish food was because I wanted to go to Spain. I had read a copy of Food Arts in like 1998 or 1997 that was talking about Ferran Adria and nobody was really focused on him at all here. Like everybody here wanted to go work for Charlie Palmer and Oriol and like, and I read that article and I was just like, I need to go to Spain. I need to go to Spain because I wanted to open up really a, veget- a vegetarian restaurant back in Seattle and I wanted to go there and he was very involved in what I thought was like focusing on like like single flavors in mm-hmm. a way that I had never really that I totally understood and, and liked but I didn't ever see anybody else doing it mm-hmm. Mm-hmm. and so I wanted to go there and so as I was leaving culinary school a friend of mine told me about a, a Spanish restaurant that was opening here and yes. the chef had worked um, in Spain um, at, a, at a really prestigious restaurant in the Basque Country actually and so I was like oh I can go there and then he'll connect me because there weren't any of these like i programs there was no one to send you to Spain because Spain wasn't at the it top was, of anyone's it, list right it was French it. French and probably I just didn't have any connections and, yeah. and you couldn't just go there yes now I feel like it, it's a lot easier because they have 150 interns and they all go through those yeah. kitchens. Yeah, but yeah, I yeah. didn't know. I didn't. So you, you. So I took a job in a Spanish restaurant. That's where I met Edder. Because right. he came here to open that restaurant. Okay, all right. You mentioned um, Fran. And yeah. from what I understand, he w- became more and more elaborate. Is that. Is that he became, um, to me, and just from the outside, because I've never eaten at the restaurant, but I, you know, obviously digested all the books. He just, for me, he be, he went from being very meaningful and like really talking my language to speaking a language that I didn't totally know or want to get to know as much as other things. Yes. Um, and, and but in the beginning, so exciting, and I'm sure so exciting to be in those kitchens down the, later on too. But. What I was interested in was this idea of like the distillation of flavors to so their like like kind of what you were talking about, like very focused flavors. And so he was making like a foam out of celery. And he was making things like the same ingredient in lots of textures, which I thought was really interesting. But it seemed like over time it became about not ever having the original texture of that food thing. Like okay. the essence of its texture aiming so involved lost, in the cooking. He had so lost in your mind he'd lost the roots. It, that that attracted you to him in the first on place? On paper. Probably, maybe not in real life, but since I never experienced it, it, on paper, I lost interest a little bit. Okay. And I also became very interested in what, in traditional Spanish cooking and in trying to parlay this idea of tapas, which I thought was the most compelling part of Spanish food. As, as an ambassador for Spanish food in a broader way, I thought right. that tapas were 
the way to do it. And he seemed, everybody else was like saying that that was like a food, like food that was beneath them. Of course now he's very involved in tapas. But at the time it was like that wasn't high enough for anybody in Spain. I didn't think, and I thought that was being lost and sort of deteriorating. And So my understanding of tapas, and you can educate me <laughs> if I'm wrong, it's the meal before the meal. And it's it's something that you'd go to, in, if you were in Spain, you'd just go and you'd pick up a few of these pieces, you'd eat it, and you'd probably just go on your way somewhere else. What made that interesting to you as a concept to open a restaurant? Because whenever I would go to Spain, it was the most convivial, most appealing way to eat. I just thought, that's this is what, this is... Uh, this is, for me, it was the purest expression of quality of life that we don't have and that they had. <laughs> like, it was convivial. It was um, flexible, not expensive. You could go by yourself. You could go with another person. You could meet somebody there. You could meet a whole group of people. Um, there was quality involved. It was simple. It wasn't mm -hmm. like... It could be very simple or very acrobatic. Like, it just, it was so easy to like. But, you know, there are reasons why it's difficult. You know, among them, because um, it's a lot of individual stuff. And, like, yes. it's much easier to feed somebody a plate of paella and make a lot of money off of 30 cents worth of rice than it is to put a $2 anchovy on a piece of bread and do all that by hand, all in a minute. That's... It's, it's not easy, but there are other good things about tapas that make it very practical. All right, so this is a good way to segue now to okay. what I was speaking about in the beginning, which is to talk about a couple meals that I had at your restaurant, which I think um, sort of, uh, I think they're good reflections as to what <laughs> your idea of flavors are. Mm -hmm. And I wanted to start with the uh, is it pimento, uh, blustered peppers yeah. with sea salt mm -hmm. and on the face of it it seems like a very simple <laughs> dish mm -hmm. but when I when I bit into it, it the, the flavors were also some was unexpected right. <laughs> because I would never it, it's sort of sometimes it, it tastes kind of like uh, like a potatoes potato like ah. and uh, it was unexpected so I'm like what, what is this but, but the simplicity of it and then biting into it and getting that sort of surprise was a sort of a great experience for me. Mm -hmm. And I don't know if that's what you aim for. <laughs> Absolutely. I mean, that's a Basque dish. So that's right. like the most minimalist kind of like, like reductive, like kind of dish. But it's funny that you should mention those peppers because those peppers are, they're a Japanese varietal that is also used in the Basque country or very similarly. And, and in a similar way. And when I when we first started cooking those peppers, nobody was cooking them. And now they're at every single restaurant in town, whether they're Italian or Spanish or whatever. And and we were for sure first. And um, and I, the, what was really interesting was at the time that I had those peppers in the Basque country, Edder was working at a Japanese restaurant and they were also serving them at a Japanese restaurant. And I was like, so I went to a, no, I went to Edward's Japanese restaurant. I was like, these are like the peppers that we had in the Basque country. And for me, it was a revelation as well. And then I started to seek those peppers out. So the, like the woman who grows most of those peppers are, and her ex-husband, because they both grow them. <laughs> uh, lots of people get divorced, <laughs> not just in the restaurant business, but in the farm business. And um, uh, yeah, she grows them because we asked her to grow a lot of them. Because the people who were buying them from her was like, you know, like 10 people, you know, people come and buy 10 peppers. We started buying... 10 bags of peppers a week like it was crazy how many peppers and since then we've given her seed for other pep other varietals that are typical in spain oh wow and so so all right, that, that's graciously they've grown <laughs> them for us and everybody else because now everybody else buys them too I, and i know for for you know for any restaurants and, and for as much as you, you you love cooking and edra loves cooking uh, that that's something else i wanted to talk about you brought up something else which is uh, your suppliers you you are intricately involved with you know the supplies that you get. So for, when we How just we buy is defines our cuisine, and even just the green market. Like we go there and we hand pick the stuff. We don't just have it delivered to the door. You're gonna get a box of plum tomatoes de delivered to the door, and when the plum tomatoes are good, they're good, and when they're bad, they're bad. But like you can deal with them. But like 
I've dealt with some of these like aggregators who you know supposedly are bringing you amazing green market stuff and unless you go and pick your own it's not the same and I think that to me is like what uh, for us it's like the intimacy of that's why we run small restaurants so, so you go. So the ritual is basically either you or three or four days a week we go and handpick. Okay, so like probably very early in the morning. It used to be like I would get there at six in the morning. Now I have enough relationships where they hold stuff aside from us, but then we go and like, you know, accept or re or reject. And then for things like tomatoes, we'll like handpick or things that are very specific. And then. The people know what size we want to, so like, I mean, we'll go in and we'll just like, you know, if we get a bag of eggplant this big, we'll start throwing out the ones that are too big. Um, or, you know, okay. now we more siphon through, like we sift through that's great. stuff that's been set aside for that's us. That's good. Yeah. The other the other meal I was going to talk about, which is another meal that my, when my wife and I ate at uh, Alvara, uh -huh. Lavara, La I'm sorry, <laughs> is... um. The uh, oh, do, so the peppers you had them at El Quinto Pino. Yes. No, okay. So those no, are. I had I had them both. I, I had them okay. at. Okay. Uh, there are two Pino. different varieties. And then I had them at Lavara. Right. So Lavara has the one that's the Japanese varietal, and yes. El Quinto Pino has a Galician pepper. But they're different. Uh, but now they're, you they, mentioned they're prepared it. the same. You, you, you're right. They, they do taste different. <laughs> and I'm not surprised they kind of have a potatoy background because they're both nightshade potato and and peppers, and their leaves probably have something in common. I you know I don't know, but wow. So the, the other thing is the um, at Lavar's uh, La is the um, the bread that you had. You, you, you served with bread with I think um, fava beans and uh, oh. and uh, um, I don't know tuna on top of it. And when I bit into that, there was sort of uh, different levels of flavor in that one. <laughs> and I don't know where that came from. I don't know what dish that is. I wonder if like one of my cooks made something special, like. Um it was was the fava bean a puree? Yes. And then um, and it was with tuna. Yes. I know what you're talking about, but it um, is that something that you played around with? And no, it's something I told my cook to make, but I'm trying to remember what the context of of it was. Well, what? I know I sent it I sent it over and I gave him some instructions, but I can't remember why why specifically we made that dish. Well, honestly. that brings up a whole bunch of other questions then. Mm -hmm. Which that I, is that I have like senior moments. <laughs> No, 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 no. <laughs> that you trust your chefs enough to sort of, you know, just give them little instructions and to for them to sort of improvise. Well, that, that intimacy that I was talking about, we have that relationship with our cooks too. So they they have seen every di every dish sort of. It's like all on a, co a continuum. Right. And so there are variations on dishes, or we'll use the same vinaigrette for. You know, we have like signature flavors, and mm -hmm. then we apply those flavors to sometimes signature dishes or sometimes like traditional dishes. So that's so, what happens. So that tells me that the way that you run your restaurant is that you're hoping for people that work here to sort of grow. <laughs> well, yeah, and they've been here. Most of them have been here for a long time. There's a lot of mentorship that happens. We recently had a little bit of reshuffling. Not that the people have left, because, mm -hmm. but they will shortly, and so... Um, uh, so we started training people well ahead. Like we're kind of overstaffed, and, and then we're trying to make the people we've mentored mentor the new people so that it costs a lot of money, but it, it gives us a lot of peace of mind. <laughs> the impression that the, you know, average American gets about, you know, chefs nowadays is, you know, in the kind of wider culture is Gordon Ramsay, <laughs> which is, right. you know, this quite tyrannical person yelling at people all the time. Right. And um, it's good to know that you can still serve good meals without doing that. <laughs> right. I kind of bet that he's not that bad. I mean, I have no idea, but I, it was another error. And I think people, I think also when people are young, they scream and yell a lot and they get that reputation. And then the mm -hmm. young people who worked for them when they were young go off and tell these stories. And then that's the persona that they develop. And then they go on TV. And when you're on TV, you need, like, you and I can talk normally, but I've been on TV before and I've seen myself on TV and, like, it's like, wah, 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 wah. Like, if you're not larger than life, like, you're not on TV, you know, and... It's a very good point you're making. So he's playing so like I, a, he's playing he's like a character of himself. Sure, like a parody of himself. I mean, I'm oh sure he's hot-tempered, and I'm sure he has very high standards and whatever, but, like, just, I mean, I think it's kind of funny that he's actually, like, 
judging restaurants that he probably would never even go and eat in. You know what I mean? Like, they're so <laughs> beneath his standards. Of, I, I don't know. All right, so let me bring up another meal then. And, and my wife ate this. It was in eggplants. Um, and I think she had it more than I did. And, and uh, you're aware of that one. <laughs> With honey? Uh, yeah. With honey on it? Yes. Yeah. Where did that one come from? Well, so this is what I always say. Like, there's people who say that they're Spain-inspired restaurants or Spanish-inspired restaurants. I always say we are Spanish restaurants that are inspired by everything else. And I think that's a real difference. Like, I don't make excuses for our food not being Spanish enough. To me, our food is Spanish to the core. We take inspiration from lots of other cultures, but our food's Spanish. And I really think that that is what distinguishes us, like, from people who, like, copy us and then call themselves Spanish-inspired. Um, so that dish is a Spanish dish. There are two, like, provinces that fight over it, or, like, two places. So some people some people say that it is, um, well, one variation of that dish is Catalan. Mm -hmm. And I first had that dish in Catalonia. And then there are people who say that it's Malagueño from the south. It doesn't really matter because I believe it's probably Jewish. And it went from, you know, south to north. Mm -hmm. and, um, but so that is eggplants with honey, fried eggplants with honey. Then there's another dish in Murcia that is called Moxil. And it's also eggplant and honey. And it's also fried, but it's layered like a lasagna, almost more like, like, um, and it also has honey on it, but it has cheese. Oh, wow. <laughs> and a lot of goat cheese is from Murcia, and so I'm sure that's why they made this, like, layered casserole. Or maybe they made eggplant and honey, and they had a leftover, and then they started to layer it with cheese and baked it for another meal. Like, right. who knows? Or maybe, I mean, those kind of, like, dairy and vegetable meals also very Jewish. Right. Um, and, like, kind of kugly. I mean, I don't know. Like, I just like that, just kind of, like, lasagna and layered baked dish, like, something you can make passively, like, on a Sabbath. It, like, it all makes sense to me for La Barra. So, um, so we did a, a marriage of both. We did the melted cheese on the bottom. Yes. And um, with the crispy um, eggplant and the honey drizzle over the top. And the idea of putting the nigella seed on it, I, we've been using nigella seed here at Chiquito for a, lot of t a long time too. But and so what exactly is that, just for listeners I know that. I, the reason I know nigella seed is because I know it from Afghani bread that I love. It's like long, like sheets of like almost focaccia-like. Roman style, like mm -hmm. pizza, Bianca. So the the Pakistan, or I mean the the Afghanis would make this amazing bread, and then they would like scatter these nigella seeds on them. They have a very particular pungent flavor that mm -hmm. goes really well with olive oil or anything fried, I think. And then it goes amazing with honey. And so, but the reason I put it on is because there is a, an Armenian cheese that's braided like string cheese that melts pretty well and it has nigella seed in it. So I knew cheese and nigella were friends and that we have a sandwich here that's cheese and bacon and nigella seed. And so when I wanted to do the cheese and, I didn't want to do a straight up moxil because I didn't want to have it be a baked dish. I wanted it to be crispy and fresh and like, um, and so it's a variation on moxil but instead of putting herbs and like sort of more pizza spices we put the nigella seed and I knew that it would go well with the cheese because of this Armenian cheese. So, so the, I mean, it, it's a Spanish dish, but yeah. it is informed, like the actual flavors that make it personal are informed by all these other things that, that, that we love and we explore on, Do, our, on our free time. <laughs> absolutely. You have three restaurants now and I've read that you're considering opening up a fourth. Is that... Yeah, it sounds nice. It, so, it sounds nice. I bet it probably sounds nicer than it is in practice. But <laughs> Absolutely. Like, yeah, I'm very, I'm in, I like what I do. I like get excited about it still. So how do you how do you consider preparing meals or for a particular restaurant? How do you, like, for instance, this the, you, w the restaurant we're in right now, you said it's a sort of Basque-inspired mm -hmm. or Basque restaurant. How do you go in and you say, these are the list of dishes for this restaurant. There are dishes I feel like we need to have because we want to tell a story and I want to tell it from beginning to end. And so there are dishes I feel like we need to have and then there are dishes I just really want to have. And then I find a balance between those. And then I make sure that they, I mean, the practical aspect of it that's not fun for the other people to think about, but it actually ends up creating a very balanced menu in terms of textures and, and temperatures and stuff, is how is it going to hit the stations so that we can do a service. 
So I need to okay. make sure that cold station gets like some of the dishes, hot station gets another air fryer. Like I need to make sure that we touch on all that practical aspects of, of running a restaurant because you got to get the food to the table. <laughs> Absolutely. And then, then, then mixed into that is also your need to experiment too, right? Right. And well, and telling the story because I can find that tweaking the dishes is and making them personal is all I need. There's enough room in Spanish cuisine for me to move. And that's what I love about, that's why it works for me. Because I like having a little bit of a box because otherwise I would, I mean, you can see all the influences in the food. Right. If I just was like New American, I would be all over the place. Okay, all right. So, so I actually like the discipline of working in one, one, yeah, one type of food so sort of, one continent because, or one country because it really has a lot of regional cuisines within it. Yeah. What's the story? This, the story you're trying to tell? Like for, this well, is a the, El Quintopino is a story about traveling from north to south and eating tapas and, and, and trying to show, show people the cuisines that divide, that, I mean, the, the dishes that define each region. Right. And making sure we cover those and then also playing and, and showing how a tapas restaurant or like a tapas bar is actually like a, a very sort of individualistic, cool So l- let me ask this question because there, from what I understand, there are like 17 different regions in Spain, right? Probably. I've never counted them. And, I, <laughs> and we don't touch on all of them because some of them are very okay. closely related. So you, you touch on the more, the, the sort of the... <laughs> the ones that have the most influence on a region, the different region, the whole region. I fall in love with dishes and I go visit places and then I get very in love with that place for a while. So I'll like go to Menorca and I'll be like obsessed with Menorca. And like Menorca has a lot to do with La Barra. Um, and, or I'll go to, you know, Asturias and I'll like, Asturias is a bad example because Asturias is not something I have a love affair with, but I wanted to represent Asturias at El Quinto Pino. Mm -hmm. And because I wanted to represent it, but I couldn't find a lot of dishes that I could really get behind, that's why I invented the uni sandwich. (laughs) Because I have this friend who who wrote a book about Asturian food, and he had a whole chapter on eating sea urchin. And Mm -hmm. I was like, I need to have a sea urchin dish because there's nothing else in Asturias and Asturians will hate me for this, but like, <laughs> and, and a dessert that I also put on there. So when I opened El Quinto Pino, I was kind of, I had Asturias on the brain, um, but I couldn't find dishes in the, the Asturian, like, uh, paradigm that I, I thought were like unique to that region. Like they have a favada, they have great cheeses, but I couldn't find something that I thought, like this it feels really different from and, and really good okay. from like Basque or Galician, which is kind of where it's wedged in between. And I was just like, if I'm going to have this dish, I'd rather have Basque food. And if I'm going to have this dish, I'd rather have Galician food. I see what you're and saying. And so I was like, what can I make that will like really showcase Asturias? And that's where the uni panini came from. <laughs> okay. So. Or take you there, like, you know, in a visceral way. And it was, yeah. to me, it was about eating sea urchin. So the thing that before I sat down with you that I thought about and I love to come up with premises and I love to be wrong uh-huh. because the, the, the more wrong I am, the more I learn. Uh-huh. <laughs> and the thing that I, just by eating at a couple of your restaurants, your, yours and your husband's restaurants, is that I think in a way, when you talk about your dishes, the dishes that you created, it, like I said in the beginning, you're trying to minimize, you're trying to sort of, not minimize, but focus the, the, the meal into just a few, you know, a few flavors instead of it being as elaborate as possible. And it's sort of in contrast with what you were saying earlier about, you know, you sort of float from things to things. Yeah. And I think in your cooking, you're trying to live your most ideal life. Yeah. My, Oh, oh, that's my. a nice way of saying it. I love it. Yeah. It, 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 am I am I incorrect? <laughs> no, I love it. I actually, yeah. In cooking, I'm patient. I'm more quiet. I'm like I'm all these things that I would rather be. And um, so. so and joyful, like very playful. You know, whereas like I'm in a, in real life, I'm kind of a little serious. Yeah. <laughs> so in real life, you said you're not what you are when you're cooking. 
No, I have, I think, those that those things in my personality, but I don't think that other people always know that. And so, like, I guess maybe what you communicate when you're, you're you know, cooking or, you know. Let me wrap this up. You, you've done a lot of uh, media, TV stuff you've done. And um, first of all, the, the question I have in regards to that is... Do you, is it something that you see doing in the future, more of that? And how, how, how has that helped you with the restaurants, being that sort of out front? Yeah. I mean, I like that part because I like to tell the stories. And I want people to understand us. It's not before the food. Like, the food I want always... I, I always told my staff at, like, Lavar, I don't want them to tell this whole intellectual story about, like, you know how you know Spain had all these cultures like the food should stand on its own independent of the story but I like telling those stories and I like telling them to my staff so that they understand why we're making what we're making and I like telling them to other people and so I like to share I guess is the thing um, and and from that like to share it's been easy for me to in with complete conviction and like total like earnestness share the story of the restaurants with the press like I never feel like I'm like bending over or bending the concept to like fit into you know what's popular I've never second guessed what we were going to make and tried to make something because I thought somebody else was going to like it I just thought if I if we made the best food that we could make and I liked it that other people would like it too I was like okay. very honest um and I, I mean so it's not hard to get behind it and sell something that you love. Absolutely. And so I do support the restaurant any way I can, mostly responding to press requests, but sometimes just putting stuff out there. And I'm also a very creative person, so sometimes people like want to know more about what we're doing, and I'll respond. But I, um, as far as like doing more TV, I would like to, but I want it to be very editorial. You know what I mean? Uh, that I don't know if that's a word that people use in television, but like, it's, it, I would it's, rather it's, be on the radio talking to Leonard Lope yes. than um, than the popular uh, TV. Then do a, do competitive cooking show, yes. which I've done and was really fun. But I did that more for my staff, who really enjoys that kind of stuff. Like, than yeah. I did it for myself. Was it good for my restaurant? I think it was. Okay. All right. But, and we, but and I had a lot more fun like going out of my comfort zone because normally I would never do that. But we get invited to do competitive cooking shows like six times a week, and most of the time I find it very embarrassing. <laughs> like I would never, I would never do it. I would do, you know, I did Iron Chef. That was fun. And I would do like Top Chef Masters maybe. I probably end up cutting off my hand while I was doing it. <laughs> but like, or like it, you know, embarrassingly boning out a chicken. But it would, but it. You know, I would do I would do something at a high level, but I think for me it would be more fun to do. I would like to do like cross marketing kind of stuff, but not um, more like ingredient specific stuff or, or you know supporting other products that I think are amazing. Okay. You know, like well, like minded stuff. <laughs> well, we'll leave it right there. Thank you so much <laughs> for doing you. this. <laughs> please, please, please. Go to any one of Alex and Edder's restaurants. The food is great and the service is excellent. This is Warren Wade Anderson. Thank you for spending time with Inside the Phoenix.